Good Friday morning, everyone. It's the last day of September in the year 2022. My name is Tim. Uh, I'll be your host today on the Backyard Naturalist coming to you live from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, from my home attic office uh, of the Urban Ecology Center, whose mission is to help connect people in cities to nature and to each other. And one of the ways we do this is by exploring the nature of our backyards in the Backyard Naturalist, which is what we're doing today with the really fun and crazy feature called the silverfish uh, as we bring you episode five of season four of the Backyard Naturalist Silverfishing Playbook. First, a uh, quick thank you. Thank you for joining us here today, all of you. Uh, thank you for your interest in nature, in the nature of our backyards and for exploring the world with me. Uh, and an additional thank you to subscribers of this program. We really appreciate that extra bit of support that you've been able to give us. Uh, thank you to members of the Urban Ecology Center. Thank you to you for however you support uh, us and our mission. And I also want to mention that we are nearing the end of Valley Week. The Menominee Valley Partners is an absolutely fabulous organization uh, and the work that they've done to help revitalize an area that was sorely in need of healing has been tremendous. Uh, so I encourage you to look into all of the great things that the Menominee Valley Partners are doing in general. Uh, and for Valley Week, there's still a couple events happening today and tomorrow, uh, including a, a kid story hike tomorrow. And so I encourage you to visit and explore the Valley as well. And one way to do that is with us. We're running our second subscriber appreciation field trip tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. at Three Bridges Park uh, in the Valley. The, the Menominee Valley was once a lush wetland that was really huge. It was four miles long, half a mile wide, teeming with wildlife, fish, birds, mammals, plants, invertebrates, uh, fields of wild rice. Uh, and then it went through a period of, of major trauma and neglect at the hands of humans. And, and now people and organizations like the Menominee Valley Partners Inc. and others are doing great work to, to try to heal the land, get it to prosper again. So we'll be taking a short walk into the valley via Three Bridges Park. We'll explore part of the park and some of the surrounding areas to look for signs of current and past use by wildlife and humans and the interesting stories that the landscape tells us. So we'd love for you to join us. It is open to everyone and free to Backyard Naturalist subscribers. We'll be running a trip about every month. Um, and we'll be, like I said, mixing up the, the kind of day and, and time each, each month. Um, we celebrate our backyards as places that support nature, uh, that support recreation, that support relaxation. And our backyards are also places where we have views of the skies, and there's a lot going on in the skies right now. So if you're really into astronomy, there's there's just a ton to be excited about. So, uh, you know, as, as humans are trying to better understand our close surroundings in our backyard, but also our surroundings way farther away up in space. Um, so start with a, another update on the Artemis mission, uh, which has been a frustrating one to follow. We, we've been following the anticipated launch of Artemis, which is a major step towards returning humans to the surface of the moon. And at least two of these Backyard Naturalist updates came just before anticipated launches. We were hoping our fingers crossed. And unfortunately now the project is delayed again, uh, in part due to the massive hurricane Ian uh, that just swept through Florida. Uh, so understandably NASA decided to play it safe and move the rocket back to the vehicle assembly building uh, where it could be secured during the hurricane, um, and it it made it through fine. It's it's uh, it's no small task to move this massive rocket. Um, the four mile trip from the launch pad to the building takes about ten hours, uh, but again, seemed like a smart move to move it back. So now that the storm has passed, they're going to use the opportunity of uh, being while it's in the secure location in the building. Uh, to replace the batteries in that flight termination system we were talking about that protects the people on the ground in case something goes wrong during the launch and they can kind of self-destruct uh, and then they need to replace some of the other components that have a shelf like shelf life uh, like the batteries and propellant tanks and um, and it, it's a good time to do it because it has been hanging out on the launch pad for over a month and it needs these updates so the new launch date is not set but they're hoping for mid-november uh, to start this month-long, more than a month-long journey around the moon. And then the overall plan is to land humans on the moon on the third Artemis mission, which is scheduled for 2025. So uh, the mission, this first mission is already five years behind schedule, tens of billions over budget. So 
hopefully things can get a bit more efficient from here on out. Um, a, a typical per launch price tag is a little over four billion. Um, it is the most powerful rocket humans have ever made, and and so far it's it's cost forty billion. Um, but but uh, hopefully that can get back on track. But another NASA project happened exactly on time a couple of weeks ago. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that uh, the DART mission uh, had a goal of slamming a, a basically refrigerator sized spacecraft into a small asteroid, mainly to see if this would be an option to protect the planet in the future. If we did have a don't look up, if you've seen that movie kind of scenario where uh, a, a larger, more catastrophic asteroid uh, might, you know, we might find one that's on a collision course with our planets, highly unlikely, but could happen. Um, so this was kind of the first uh, way of, of understanding if, if something like that is possible, if we can deflect the, the spacecraft, the spacecraft was continually taking pictures, um, but then some telescopes on Earth, you know, 7 million miles away, uh, were able to record the collision which is incredible. And even though the asteroid that it impacted um, was very small, uh, you'll see in the short video, this the huge cloud of debris that was ejected at the point of impact. So we'll start with our first video here. It's short. Um, you may need to, I don't think this has any sound, so you don't have to worry about adjusting sound. But what you're gonna see is uh, the asteroid moving, um, and then you're gonna see the impact uh, of the spacecraft. Um, and then the cloud of dust. It's just amazing that they took this video from Earth. Oh. And there you go. The asteroid itself was was uh, you know much bigger than the spacecraft. Um, so you don't really see much of a a change, but that that's what they're going to be studying. Um, and then I have one other short video that um, is also pretty fun. Uh, this this is uh, this is the NASA control room, and now what we're seeing is the the pictures that were taken from the spacecraft as it's hurtling towards this asteroid. Um, and to me, it's it's almost as much fun to just see the the reaction of the of the NASA folks as it is to see the actual pictures. So now the work is to, you know, study, you, you can study the images that were taken to, to help better understand the structure and composition of the asteroid. But really what's important is, is to see how it affected that orbital period. So Dimorphos is a smaller asteroid that uh, revolves around its uh, another asteroid, Didymus. Um, and, then, and then we're going to see if it deflected it the way we thought it would. And then in the future, should we again suddenly realize that there's a Earthbound asteroid um, we'd likely be worried about something much bigger than Dimorphos. Uh, we'd likely need a coordinated collision of several larger spacecrafts, um, but this is this is a step in that direction. So, well, well. and then finally, um, a few months ago, I mentioned that the the Juno spacecraft, which which has been studying Jupiter for the last four years, uh, was doing a flyover of Jupiter's moon Europa. Uh, and that's a moon that has the highest potential of extraterrestrial life. 
Um, and that flyover, which got the spacecraft within 200 miles of the surface, just occurred yesterday. Uh, it took four pictures, and, and then we got to see these images pretty much right away. So it, it, it's a believe it's an ice-covered ocean, um, and you just see this incredibly complex icy surface uh, and you can start to see the the stories behind all of those things that you see, the the craters and and the lines. And the thought is that some of the major fractures are caused by rising and falling tides. You know, we have tides on the Earth that caused by our Moon. These are tides on an ocean uh, or a, a Moon that ha we believe has oceans under it um, that are caused by Jupiter, the massive gravitational pull of Jupiter. So uh, it also was able to take. Uh, magnetic field measurements, which indicated there's an electrically conducting layer under that icy surface, like a salty ocean. And so this further strengthens the thought that there's a liquid ocean flowing on the planet under the ice. So the next steps, we're, we're sending a lot more to Europa for that reason. So uh, NASA has the Europa Clipper mission, which is set to launch in a couple of years, which will make uh, more close flybys, and it'll assist a European mission, the, the which is the JUICE mission, Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, uh, by the European Space Agency, which is scheduled to launch next year. And that's going to study uh, Europa and a couple of other moons. Um, and th this, this picture, this is all extra. So Juno's mission wasn't to take this great these great pictures. Juno's mission was to study the planet Jupiter, um, which it did. And it, it finished its mission. It, it, it made repeated dives, getting really close to the planet, getting underneath the clouds of Jupiter and recording uh, never seen before lightning high in the atmosphere. It recorded rain, but not water rain. It was uh, these ammonia rich baseball size kind of hail rain that scientists nicknamed mush balls. Um, and it's not done. So it's uh, last year, NASA approved an extended mission of 42 additional orbits of Juno. And that allowed uh, a close flyby of the moon uh, Ganymede last year. It, it allowed for this flyby of Europa. And then for the next two years, it's going to get close-up looks at the moon Io, uh, which is the most volcanically active place in the solar system in 2023 and 2024. So NASA is being frustrated with its current mission, uh, but it's got a lot of successful things going on as well. Um, OK, so on to something a little bit closer to our actual backyards and what you tuned in for here, the silverfish. And um, silverfish, silverfish is it, that's part of it's a it's part of a community of animals that not only lives in our backyards. There are a lot of silverfish in our backyards, um, but a lot of those backyard critters have found a way into our house. They use our backyards as a conduit to get into our houses. And um, we have a you have a a healthy community of invertebrates in your house, um, and you know. If you think about it, a lot of animals out there are appreciating this controlled atmosphere you're providing them in your house as just as much as you do. So, you know, we we tend to want to keep our house relatively constant temperature, humidity. Uh, we use furnaces or boilers. We use fans, humidifiers, dehumidifiers, and there's some critters that are appreciating this controlled environment as much as we do. So, um, you know, you're not just doing this for yourself. Uh, they don't have to brave the cold winters and hot summers outside. Um, and so, you know, because of this, a lot of the critters that we featured in the past um, as, as part of this community that, that shares both our yards and our houses. So early on, we had a, an episode on spiders. Spiders don't hurt us, but as predators, they help to control the, the housebound animal communities. They keep a nice balance. Um, they kind of prevent the uh, infestations of certain bugs we don't want. So it's good there's spiders around. We featured their cousins, the harvestmen, or the daddy longlegs, which are also fantastic predators. Um, but uh, you, you may have heard the urban myth that daddy longlegs have enough venom to kill a human, but they can't bite you or can't penetrate your skin, so they can't kill you. That's all a myth because not only can't they bite us or sting us, they don't have any venom at all. So even if they could, they can't harm you. Um, we have featured the the roly polies, pill bugs, or isopods that often make their way into our basements, uh, areas of high humidity. This is a critter that we, is one of the most dedicated parents in the invertebrate world. Uh, mom not only carries eggs on her body, she carries young for quite a while after they hatch, so a really dedicated mother. Uh, we have the wonderful little ladybugs or ladybird beetles that 
sometimes make their way into our attics or our bathrooms in the fall uh, to spend the winter in a, in a more secure place. The, the lady, ladybird beetle is a, a master of origami, the way they can fold up their delicate flying wings underneath that thick outer elytra. We have the wonderfully weird centipedes, which also don't hurt us and also keep down uh, the numbers of other pests as wonderfully efficient predators. Um, but for many of us, that alien form is just a little too much to handle, and so they tend to elicit more fear uh, than they probably deserve. And so together, these critters are among this, this uh, hopefully healthy invertebrate community that's in all of our houses. So just like it's important to have a diverse biome of bacteria in your gut, uh, in your body, it's important to have a diverse biome of our community of invertebrates in your house. Um, and so this is the community that uh, our feature critter, the silverfish, is an important part of. Um, and we still have plenty more of these for future episodes. I, I currently feel the pressing need to to cover fruit flies for some reason based on current conditions at my house. Um, and we still haven't, you know, we still haven't done cockroaches or termites or, or bed bugs or stink bugs or or even earwigs, which again I often confuse with silverfish. So lots of lots of future fun for all of us that love these these incredibly adorable uh, insects that are in our house. And actually silverfish was suggested by one of you a while back as a featured organism. Um, and at the time I wasn't even sure that I had ever seen one in my house. Because again, I, I I can I often, when I see one, I think, is it an earwig? But then it was just a couple months ago, uh, I was I was moving some things around uh, on this desk that I'm sitting at now. Um, and it was a, a little bit later at night. And I turned on a light, I moved uh, something on the desk and there I saw this really beautiful silverfish for just a, just a second. Uh, I got a, a good look and then it just scurried away. Um, and it really is, a, in my opinion, a beautiful creature. Um, so, so we'll start our closer look at the silverfish. At its basic level, it is an insect, um, even though at a glance, it, it doesn't look like your typical insect or your typical winged insect. It, it, it looks to me like an insect larva. You know, So if you're, if you're looking at a, a damselfly or, or other insects in their aquatic form, they'll often look like this. Um, but it is an insect. It's an insect in the order uh, Zygentoma, which includes uh, some insects with some, some fun names, the silverfish, the fish moths, and the fire brats, or if you live in Wisconsin, the fire brats, I think. Um, the, these are good hexapods, good six-legged insect groups that, that have, you know, kind of a flattened body, compound eyes, um, and this group of insects is characterized by three long tail filaments, um, which distinguishes them from the cockroaches and the earwigs, which have two tail filaments. Uh, they're in the family Lepismatidae, at least the silverfish and the fire brats are. Uh, and then our silverfish, again, there's a lot of silverfish in your backyard of different species, but the one that's it makes its way into your house um, that is spread around the world with humanity is, uh, is the silverfish with the Latin name Lepisma saccharinum. Um, so you can see this nice insect body plan, six legs, antennae. Um, and again, I think the reason it doesn't look like an adult insect to me is because it doesn't have wings ever. So it not even when it's an adult, it's a wingless insect. Um, so again, many insects start out as larvae and then they pupate and then emerge as adults with wings. But in the silverfish, each larval instar just looks like a bigger version of the one before. And then at some point, the larval instars become sexually mature as bigger versions of their baby version, um, but it never goes through that pupil stage. Uh, it never, it never gets wings, and and it likely has to do with how ancient this creature is. This is a group of insects that never developed wings, and um, unlike many of the insects that we're familiar with, uh, they continue to molt throughout their lifetime, even as adults. So an adult might could molt even thirty times in a year, which is really a lot of times uh, for an insect in a lifetime, they might uh, molt 60 or more times, but again, they never gain gain wings. And it just kind of, it keeps it in that early, I don't know, prehistoric stage. Um, and it is a very old species. This, this is a species that has been around since the Devonian 400 million years ago, uh, possibly the Silurian, and it's been successful. It's had the same body plan. It hasn't changed much at all, kind of like turtles. Um, and 
you know, if you look at the environment in which the silverfish evolved, this is uh, if if any of you were able to to make Bill Keen's talk uh, talk and walk a few weeks ago on the the three billion year walk field trip um, when we when we uh, uh, looked at that the last rock the the youngest rock um, that was one that was from the Devonian and and the Devonian is the age of fishes so no dinosaurs yet no trees yet. The forests were made of lycopods and cycads and ferns and fungi, fungi the size of trees. Um, and so this is the environment in which the silverfish has evolved and stayed with us. You know, most of the insects that most of the animals from that period are extinct, um, but the silverfish is, has been around since then. So it's a, a body plan and a behavior that's been very successful. Um, again, it hasn't changed much at all. So now, if you're lucky enough to see a silverfish in your house, um, it might be worth a, a little pause to reflect on the fact that you're looking at a really old creature, a, a, a kind of a living fossil. Um, at first reflection, at least to me, the name silverfish seems a bit odd for an insect. Um, but when you think about it, it, it seems very appropriate uh, for a few reasons. So for one, the exoskeleton takes on a silvery sheen hence the silver part of silverfish. For two, the body segments are full of little scales that look like fish scales. They can even fall off and, and I mean, they're tiny. Uh, for three, the abdomen kind of tapers off uh, at the end, giving it like a, a fish-like, like a minnow-like appearance. Um, and then for four, when a silverfish moves, it wriggles very quickly, which gives it appearance, the appearance that it's swimming like a fish. Um, and so those are the four reasons why it's called a silverfish, and those four reasons are good enough for me. Uh, if you live in England, though, they're called silver ladies, so uh, you can decide which name you like better. And then that Latin name, saccharinum, uh, probably sounds familiar. It's, it's also very appropriate because of what the silverfish eat. The silverfish are scavengers, and they're like those little zumbas in your house they're they're going around eating anything roombas roombas not zumbas uh they're going around eating eating whatever is around they're little scavengers so I, I think a reason to appreciate them um they're 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 looking for leftovers um but that name saccharinum from saccharin which means related to sugar is because the the bulk of their food is is sugars and starches um so they're not predatory uh, like many of our other house invertebrates, they will eat protein, um, but you don't need to fear them. They they don't they don't want to bite you. They can't bite you. They don't, they can't sting you. Um, and you know, I, again, I hardly ever see them. Uh, so even though they they likely live in all of our houses, um, we just don't don't see them for a variety of reasons. And one of them is that they're nocturnal. Eternal. So I was uh, lucky enough to be up here at night. Um, and then I exposed it, and that's how I got to see it. Um, when they first emerge as these just adorable little baby uh, silverfish, um, just hatched from the egg, they're they're a lot whiter. But then as they get older, each larval instar successively gets darker and more silvery to give it that name. Um, their head looks very insect-like. Uh, they got antenna with these two small compound eyes that are separated on each side of the head. Um, one of the defenses of silverfish is if that they lose, and then there's a lot of predators in your house that want to eat them. If, they, if they're if they attacked, they can lose a, a, a tail filament, they can lose an antenna, and then they can regenerate them if need be um, in, in just a few weeks. So they, for an insect, they can live fairly long, um, three, three years on average, up to seven years. Um, they're found all over the globe. Uh, again, anywhere that usually there's houses um, with, and, and most houses have these areas that are crawl spaces, um, attics, uh, you know, they make their ways into your sinks and showers, kitchens, um, and any, any they, they like it dark, moist, and, and warmer. So I think you, you tend to get them a little bit more as you go farther south. Um, but one of the most endearing qualities of silverfish, in my opinion, uh, has to do with their reproduction. So for these little complex, these little ancient uh, critters, they have a fairly complex courtship. Um, 
especially for an invertebrate. And it lasts for over half an hour. Uh, and so the, the male and female begin, there's like three stages to their courtship. They begin standing face to face uh, where they touch their antennas together and vibrate them. Um, and then they kind of go away from each other for a bit, come back together and they touch their, their vibrating antennae, maybe checking each other out. Uh, they do this several times. Uh, and then at some point, they go into the second stage where the male runs away from the female, playing hard to get. Uh, she chases him for a little while. And then the third stage, they end up standing side by side, head to tail, like you see here. Um, and the male puts his vibrating tail against the female's body. Uh, and then that's when um, the mating culminates with, uh, as I'm blushing here, the, the male then lays down the spermatophore, which is a packet containing his sperm, puts it on the ground, and then she walks over and scoops it up using her ovipositor, uh, puts it in her, inside her body to fertilize her eggs. Uh, so now if you see a silver fish in your house, not only can you appreciate how ancient the creature is, but you can also appreciate what a romantic they are. Um, and if, you, if you've ever read The Bug Lady uh, online, if you get her emails, uh, her account of the courtship is, is, is much, much more eloquent than what I just described. Uh, so she says, uh, advancing and retreating with antennae and tail filaments, waving and quivering, whirling their abdomens in a torrid choreography, the male and female court. Eventually he spins threads from the tip of his abdomen and encloses a spermatophore. At his touch, the female advances into his web picks up the spermatophore and uses it to fertilize her eggs. So this leads us to another reason why you probably don't see silverfish very often. They don't tend to get, their populations tend to remain small. Uh, an outbreak of silverfish is pretty rare because they're slow reproducers. Um, so especially for an insect. So they have this prolonged courtship ritual. And then after that, she's only going to lay about three to six eggs at a time, a very small number for an insect. And she'll find little crevices here and there now that her eggs are fertilized uh, and, and, and lay a few here, a few there. And it takes two months for the eggs to hatch. So slow to develop, slow to grow. Uh, it takes about four months to become sexually mature. Uh, and then, you know, in a, in a typical female's lifespan, she's going to lay fewer than 100 eggs. So again, for an insect, this is a really slow reproduction. Um, and, and again, why they don't tend to take over your house like, like my fruit flies. Um, after hatching, they just become these, these, uh, these hungry scavengers that go around your house. Um, they first eat the egg out of which they hatched to kind of reclaim those important minerals like a lot of insects do. Um, after each molt, they'll, they'll also eat their exoskeleton. But then, you know, aside from that, they're, they're just out looking for food. They're grazers. Um, and again, foods that contain sugars and starches, the, the polysaccharides. Um, they're able to digest cellulose because they produce their own cellulase enzymes in their gut. Um, and they're looking for what you have lying around, uh, anything sugary, starchy. So that could be kind of like your typical food. Uh, it oftentimes includes things like glues and plasters. Um, so the they, they can be a problem if they start to eat some of the binding of materials that we want. So um, they might ruin your wallpaper, not because they want to eat the paper, um, but because they like the, the paste that, you, that the wallpaper is attached to the house with. Um, they, they, they can eat some fibers um, and damage them also, uh, things like cotton and linen and, and silk. Um, if they're really hungry, they could even eat leathers and synthetics, but that's not their primary food. That's kind of an afterthought or a byproduct of eating the 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 glues that they're attached to. Um, and so, but you know, they they also again eat the things that you want them to eat. They'll they'll eat dead insects. They'll eat leftover crumbs. Um, they'll eat hair lying around your house, the dandruff from your hair. So so they are kind of helping to to tidy up your house. Historically, what they're known for and what people have been writing about with silverfish and, and you know, they've been documenting this for, for hundreds of years. Uh, historically, they're associated with eating books. But again, it's not the books that they're eat, attracted to or eating. It's the glues that are used to bind the books. And then the, the book itself gets damaged in the process. Um, and I should say it's the glues that 
that used to be used to bind the book. So back in the day, the, the, the binding glues were made from animal products and just full of the starches that the silverfish loved. So, um, you know, if you had silverfish in your house and they found those old books, or if you have them, if you have old books in your house, uh, it, you know, it could become a problem because they're drawn to that ancient book binding. Um, if you have a modern book collection, uh, you're fine. Or if you're storing your your old books uh, in a in a place that's kind of dry and light and in, you know, in kind of the main part of your house, you're, you're probably on okay. What you'd be worried about is if you store them away in your attic in like cardboard boxes, um, places that get dark and 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 humid, uh, that could be a problem um, with silverfish. Uh, and then another thing they're, they they more used to be associated with is is shirt collars because we'd spray starches on them. Um, some people you know still still do. It's maybe less common now than it used to be, but the thing is opening up your shirt drawer and and you'd have a bunch of the silverfish in there. Again, not eating the shirts, but eating the starches that we sprayed on the shirts. And um, and so that can also damage the shirts themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, it's the same for carpets. It's not necessarily the carpets. It's the, it's the bindings, um, wallpaper, clothes, books. It's, it's, it's usually what they're after. If they can't find food, and maybe this is one of the reasons they're so successful, they can go anywhere from six months to a year without food, as long as they have water. Totally rare for an insect. And on the flip side, uh, they can go up to a year without water as long as they have food. So really they, they need one or the other for the most part. Eventually they need both, but they can go for a long period of time without food and they can go for a long period of time without water. And another characteristic of silverfish is that they're just super fast. Um, and I saw that firsthand when I when I found it. It's and they kind of swim away very quickly. And and um, so so if you do get a glimpse of them, that's that's you know take advantage of the moment because um, they're going to want to get away from from you very quickly uh, and get out of the light. Um, and being able to move fast is important because there are these other critters in your house that really do want to eat them. So primarily your house predators like your centipedes and and your earwigs and your spiders. So um, that's mainly the end of our look at silverfish. I did find this nice PBS video that, that gives a, a quick look. This is focused more on their relatives, the, the fire brats, brats, brats. Um, and you know, since it's tailgating season, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this, look at uh, fire brats, but also is really, they're, they're closely related. And, and a lot of this is um, also focused on silverfish. Tim, is there sound? Oh, good call. Oh, you guys, yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn on sound, thank you. Do you hear it now? Can you hear it now? Yep. In the middle of the night, you walk into the bathroom. What is that? It's shaped like a fish and even has shimmering scales. But it also has legs, six of them. This insect is a fire brat. Fire brats and their close relative, the silverfish, don't come out of your drain as it might seem. They just happened to wander into your sink and can't climb out. Sorry, pal. They live in dark places, hiding in your walls or a stack of newspapers. If they're near a source of warmth, all the better. They get the name Fire Brat from their attraction to heat. And they like to live where they eat. This page could make a tasty meal. Fire brats and silverfish are the original bookworms. They love the books you keep meaning to open. They also love the cereal in your kitchen. Look closely. You'll see traits some of the earliest insects had around 400 million years ago. 
Take these three long filaments. The two outer ones are called cerci. They work like antennae, detecting chemicals and predators, like this house centipede. Other insects, like cockroaches, have a short pair of cerci. But very few insects have this third one, called the median caudal filament. Its tiny hairs detect the faintest air currents. A fire rat is born as a mini version of itself. That's rare for insects. This ancient way of developing is called a metaboly. It's totally different than the metamorphosis an insect like a butterfly goes through, from caterpillar to pupa to adult. That's called holometaboly. This complete transformation is an advantage. The caterpillar feeds on leaves, the adult nectar. So a butterfly doesn't compete with its younger self for food. But a fire rat does, sharing its food at every life stage. Luckily, it can go months between meals. Like the original insects, fire rats don't grow wings. Most insects do. I mean, wings are useful. You can reach different kinds of food and steer clear of predators. The diversity of insects exploded when wings appeared. That's why there's hundreds of thousands of species of flies. Yes, mosquitoes are flies. And only a few hundred species of fire brats and silverfish. Maybe you're thinking, why didn't fire brats just change to be more like other insects? The thing is, evolving doesn't mean an animal or plant keeps moving towards some ideal version of itself. All it has to do to survive is keep up a big enough population. And fire brats have for millions of years. Also, as far as pests go, they're not so bad. They don't bite or sting, and they have enzymes in their gut that digest tough cellulose. One day, we might even be able to harness those enzymes to make biofuels from plants. Not bad at all for an insect firmly set in its ways. Hi, it's Laura. Getting a little tired of your roommates right now? Here's a playlist of some deep look critters that would happily move in if you let them, like ants. All right. So, uh, at the end of the day, oops, um, if you notice that you're a silverfish, because like me, you saw one once, um, there's really not a lot you have to worry about. You're, you're providing them with the ideal conditions. They like temperatures between you know, 70 and 80 degrees. They like humidity between 75 and 95%. Uh, that describes a lot of our houses through much of the year. Um, it's, a, it's a lot easier to live in those conditions. And if you do want to discourage them from being in your house, the best thing to do is to keep your house clean uh, and take away the things that they're scavenging uh, and secure things, especially in your attics, um, in, in plastic containers, sorry, metal. Uh, that they can't get into, you know, anything in a cardboard box is going to be fair game. Um, if you have them and you're worried, uh, again, you don't really have to worry about things like infestations. They're very slow to grow, reproduce. Uh, so if you still worry, just remember they're not harmful to you. They can't bite you. They don't want to be near you. Uh, they don't spread diseases. And they really just want to stay in these dark, undisturbed spaces, the crawl spaces. Uh, so if it's okay with you, they're okay just kind of eking out a living in your house, coming out at night in hidden places and going to bed before you wake up. Uh, they're, they're really good at this kind of cohabiting, cohabitating relationship. Uh, neither of you have to provide any awkward small talk. You can just kind of rest easy knowing you got each other's backs. Um, I'm guessing most of you probably haven't seen them in your house. You probably didn't know they were in your house and it's okay to go back to not thinking about them. But if you do see one, uh, I just encourage you, if it allows you to just feel lucky that you're you're looking at a very ancient, very successful creature, and then you can part ways and go back to your life and let them go back to theirs. So thank you for joining me. I will stop sharing my screen here. <laughs>